Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you might be. It is my great pleasure to welcome Peter Hawks from Radboud University. Uh, he is one of the speakers whom I managed to hunt down during a conference we met in St. Louis. And we're talking and talking and talking. I said, look, come on, you've got to give a talking word. So, and he agreed. So here he is. It's equivariant analytic torsion and an equivariant well dynamical zeta function. Peter, the floor is yours. The zoom is yours. Take it away. Thanks very much, uh, Piotr, for the introduction and for the chance to, to give this talk. Um, yeah, I want to basically this talk is about explaining uh, this title. So my plan is to explain the, the classical notions of analytic torsion and the world dynamical zeta function. And then I'll explain the word and because uh, they, they would, they're related and that's why uh, they're both in the title. And in the second part of the talk, I'll explain how to add the words, how to add the word equivariance to both of them. And then also say a little bit about how they um, are related, but th that's a bit more speculative. So that's my plan. Uh, this is based on uh, work with him and Sarah Chandran from Adelaide. We have two preprints, uh, one on analytic torsion and one on the dynamical zeta function. And this talk is about those things. I'm also working with my current PhD student, Chris Pyrie, on, uh, on things related to this topic. So as I said before, this is my plan, explain the classical notions of analytic torsion and this uh, zeta function, and also how they're related. That's Fried's conjecture. Then I'll talk about how to add the words equivariant and how a relation between those two equivariant things um, might, what it might look like. All right, so I'll start with analytic torsion. Um, in this whole talk, I'm looking at a compact connected, uh, I'm, no, compactness will be dropped in the end, but I'm looking for now, I'm looking at a compact connected oriented Romanian manifold. I'm calling it dimension N. I want to associate, um, I want to look at a flat vector bundle on M. So I'm, I'm doing that via representation of the universal cover M tilde. Um, so Sorry, just a quick technical question. You, do you assume that it is without boundary or you don't care? No, without boundary. Yeah, no boundary. Without. No okay. Boundary. okay. So I'm looking at a unitary representation, finite dimensional of the fundamental group of M. I'm calling this row. This will be used in the, most of the talk. And, oh. I'm forming the uh, the differential forms twisted by uh, by rho. So rho representation of the of the fundamental group defines the Hermitian vector bundle over M. And I'm twisting the p forms by by that vector bundle. It looks like this. So the, the p forms twisted by rho is to take the, the p forms on the universal cover, tensor with c to the r, and then inside the so, so the, the fundamental group acts on the universal cover. And on P forms by pullback, and X on C to the R by the representation rho. And this is the space of P forms twisted by rho. On that, we have uh, a natural flat connection, namely just the exterior derivative on the universal cover, except by the identity on C to the R. Looks like this. So I'm going at D rho P, uh, the, the twisted uh, exterior derivative on, on twisted P forms which still satisfies uh, the squares to zero just because this does. And this is um, a flat connection on this flat vector model in this sense. Now we can define, we have a, we have a differential or something that, that squares to zero, so we can define cohomology. Cohomology is just a kernel modulo the image in the grid P. And uh, in the case where rho is a trivial representation, is just reduced to the usual Duran cohomology. So then the, the, the twisted P forms are just the P forms so you complexify. The, this differential is just the usual Duran differential. And this cohomology is just the usual Duran cohomology, where it is tensor by, by C. So you could hope that by allowing non trivial rows, you could get more invariance, more kinds of cohomology to give you some extra information. Uh, but this talk is about what happens if it doesn't give you more information. I'll, I'll mention it in a second. Um, as we know, for the RAM cohomology, you can realize RAM cohomology as a kernel of the Hodge Laplacian. Same is true in this setting. So we take, um, in the usual way, we form the formal adjoint of this twisted differential just by using the Hodge star operator uh, in this sign in front of it. Um, the Hodge star just acts on the P forms. 
and as the identity on this twisted, on this vector body twisting by. In the same way as for the RAM differential, we can just form a formal adjoint in this way. And we can use that to define a Laplacian. And this Laplacian is the, the thing that, that analytic torsion is, is, is based on. So just d star d plus dd star acting on p forms, where we now twist by this representation row, the flat vector bundle defined by row. I'm calling that delta row p. This will play an important role. And Roch's theorem says that the kernel of that is isomorphic to this cohomology space. This will also be used quite a bit, induced by the inclusion of the kernel of the Laplacian in the kernel of this uh, differential. Okay, so we have this twisted cohomology and it equals the kernel of the twisted Laplacian. Let's look at an example. I will look at the simplest possible example, or maybe the second simplest example uh, several times in this talk, which is the circle. From the circle, I'm realizing it's R mod Z. And uh, I'm looking at um, the, the simplest case would be where rho is the trivial representation. I'm looking at the second simplest case where rho is not quite the trivial representation with just some, some unitary representation, um, which looks like this. We have a real parameter alpha, which gives us a representation, a reduced representation rho of the fundamental of the circle. Like this. In this case, the zero forms and the one forms twisted by rho are, are isomorphic. So at the, at the level of the zero forms, writing out the definition becomes this. We take the smooth functions on R, the universal cover. We have this periodicity mm -hmm. property. And the one forms is the same thing times dx. And the Laplace operator is just minus second derivative. So what is this cohomology in this case? We can compute everything, so it's all very nice. The kernel of the Laplacian, so that means we look at functions with second derivative zero and this transformation property. Well, if this factor here is, is trivial, it's just one, then we just get the constant function. So if this alpha is two is in two pi z, so this is one, then we just get constant functions. But if alpha is not in two pi z, if this is not, so if this is not a trivial representation, you just get zero. So if the hope was to get more invariance, then we failed. Uh, if, if we include non-trivial rows, we just get zero, um, which could be disappointing. But the idea is to use the vanishing of cohomology to define the secondary invariant. So by a secondary invariant, I mean an invariant which is which you can construct because another invariant vanishes. So cohomology is a primary invariant, and we will see that if that vanishes. That allows us to define a new invariant, which is analytic torsion. So how is that defined? <clears throat> we start with a zeta function associated with the spectrum of this Laplace operator. What we do is we take the, the non-zero eigenvalues of this Laplace operator um, to the power minus s, where we take s to be sufficiently with sufficiently large real part. Uh, we sum them, which is the same thing as saying we take a trace of the, the minus s power of the Laplacian where we leave out the kernel. And Wiles law says that the, the jth um, eigenvalue goes like something like uh, j to the two over n. So it means that for, for s with large enough real part, this will converge. So on, the, on that open half plane, the complex plane, this is a nice convergent series, a uh, nice convergent um, sum. And it was proved in, in the 40s that uh, this extends to a meromorphic function on C, which is regular near zero. Uh, a more modern proof is uh, using heat kernel asymptotics. This is in a book by Berlin, Getzler, and Vernier as well. So this extends to a meromorphic function on C. So we can evaluate this zeta function at zero and also its derivatives. Sorry, may I have a question? Yes. So this original formulation from uh, 49 was already established for this uh, twisted uh, zeta function. Excuse me? Uh, this theorem dates back to the uh, 49, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering whether this uh, original formulation of this theorem was already for this twisted case, taking into account this representation at all? Um, I'm not right, not sure right now. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd look it up. I would guess that the original theorem from from those times probably would be or non-twisted case, and maybe those results regarding this representation came later. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure how much different they are. How much? How, if they're really fundamentally different, I expect. I don't know what their formulation was, but uh, yeah. Usually, what happens is that if your fundamental group is no longer finite, then the universal cover is no longer compact. So, I expect that this. Uh, this theory would be rather more difficult, yes. Well, we're still working on a compact manifold. No. So we're using a, we're, we're not working on the universal cover, we're using on the, working on the manifold itself, which is compact. So we still have nice discrete spectrum and everything. Um, so I'm just using the universal cover to define a flat vector on the, on the compact manifold itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, so, so I'm taking the associated vector bundle, associated representation row. But we're still working on M itself, which is compact. So I don't see, I don't think that the, the twisted case is much more different from the untwisted case. Okay. Okay. But, thank I, you. but I don't know. I haven't checked their formulation. But in... okay. Thank you. May I comment? Sure. So, so probably the, this is uh, so you had in mind. I, I'm not into Adam. Maybe you are talking about uh, L two cohomology. Right. For yeah, example, spaces, yeah. but 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 these cohomologies, there are cohomologies of the, the RAM complex twisted by parallel sections of a flat vector bundle over a compact manifold. So non-compactness of this uh, universal covering has nothing to do with uh, properties of of this. Uh, Complex downstairs as uh, I, will, I will actually mention in the second half of the talk, I will mention the case where you do go to, to the universal cover where you take the L2 space. So then it's more difficult. Well, not for the yeah, yeah. But I will actually go into the non-compact case, which includes the case of where you work on the universal cover itself. But that'll be uh, in a little bit. But so far I just Okay, but to, to summarize, uh, to summarize our Laplacian has discrete spectrum, yes. That's right, has discrete spectrum. Okay, I'm, okay. That's what I'm, I'm going to sum. And we have Wiles law because we're going to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have this zeta function, which is uh, which is a nice function here, zero. So we can look at its derivative at zero. We define it for the Laplacian on p forms here, and we can. Um, we can write this thing down. So we take a kind of alternating sum over all P. We also multiply by, by this uh, P. And then we add a factor minus a half, which is a convention, take the exponential. And this is a number you can then uh, define. It may look a bit funny if you see this for the first time. I'll, I'll, I'll mention reformulation later, which uh, may motivate us a little bit. But we can write down this number. Turns out to be a positive number. This is a real, it's a real. And Ray and Singer show that if cohomology vanishes, then this number is independent of the choice of the Ramanian metric. So we use the Ramanian metric to define a Hodge star, which is used in the definition of the Laplacian, which influences the spectrum. But if you form this number, and if cohomology vanishes, then this doesn't depend on the metric that you chose. And the proof is rather is a little bit subtle. It's not just some abstract homotopy invariance. It's it's a it's a computation involving heat kernel asymptotics. What you do is what they what they did is you take a path, a smooth path of money metrics. For every one of those metrics, you have this ablation and you have this, this notion of torsion. Take the derivative of that, of the log of that, and then you do a computation. It turns out to equal some combination of traces. Of operators which act on the kernel of the Laplacian. So this is uh, Hodge star sub t means the Hodge star for the Riemannian metric associated with time t. So whatever this is, if this kernel is zero, then we just get zero. So I'm, I'm showing this to indicate that it's it's a bit of a subtle argument. It's not just an abstract homotopy. Uh, homotopy. In any case, so if this primary invariant vanishes, then the secondary invariant is really invariant. This was the, the goal. And they also proved some basic properties back in 71. So first of all, if the dimension of the manifold is even, then it's trivial. So it's only interesting for odd dimensional manifolds. 
And there's a product formula, so there's a lot of text here, but what, what's really happening here is suppose that for, you have two manifolds, M1 and M2, uh, we have two representations, row one and row two of their fundamental groups. We can then uh, form, combine them into a representation of the fundamental group of the product. That is, that is torsion. Uh, and there's, a, there's an expression for that in terms of analytic torsion of the individual manifolds and the order characteristic of the twisted complex twisted by representation for one and row two. So yeah, we know how this how this works for um, for Cartesian product manifold. Since then, there have been more elaborate theorems for for non-trivial fiber bundles as well. They're much more difficult. And let's go back to the circle because uh, I like this example. Um, Sorry, could, could could you come back to the previous page? Yeah. So from this proposition, mm -hmm. it turns out that even if M one and M two are of um, or the dimension, then the combined torsion must be one. That's right. That's right. That's actually this. So it means that these two, these two, uh, this combination on the right hand side must be equal to one. So it means that torsion of one raised to some power depend depending on m two times the second factor must be. This must be inverse of of of, of this second thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we need one of them to be even dimensional, one of them to be odd dimensional. So supposing n1 is even dimensional and n2 is odd dimensional, yeah. then this is uh, one, so this, this drops out. And then we get uh, the torsion of n2, which is odd dimensional, raised to the other characteristic of n1. Because, um, yeah, so, so we, need, we need one of them to be even dimensional and one of them to be odd dimensional. And then one the, 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 the factor where mj is even dimensional will, will, will not be there, which is one. So why people do not take the root of this torsion of the degree equal to the Euler characteristic, then it would be strictly commit, uh, multiplicative. Sorry, I didn't quite follow that. If you take, if you take the root of this torsion mm -hmm. of the degree equal to the Euler characteristic, then this expression is strictly multiplicative for me. Um, is, is that, is that, um, is that true? Because we have two other characteristics. Yeah, yeah yes. the, the, the root. <laughs> then on the right hand side, you have something depending on, because the other characteristic is, uh, yeah, but it's the root of the other manifold, so uh -huh. two different. Two different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so if you take the root, uh, but I don't see how you cook up a multiplicative formula. I, I don't, 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 don't see it because this characteristic is of a different manifold of which you take this T. So we're mixing up the Euler characteristics here, right? Exactly. Think... Yes, so, so, yes, so therefore, if you have this Euler characteristic. Uh, if this Euler characteristic is multiplicative, then taking the root, you obtain something which is strictly multiplicative. Mm, that's exactly what I don't see. I mean, Why? No, take, take the root. But how would the degree equal to the product of these two chi's? Take your one, you take the, the square root. Yeah. Then root. you have. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then here you divide by. Of course, it requires two things. This chi must be not zero. zero. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Maybe okay. Maybe we'll the <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe it's a stupid observation, but I couldn't yeah, it's, it's, it, makes it, it, makes it, it makes it natural property. Yeah. Okay. Um, back to the uh, to uh, my favorite example, um, circle. And now I want to indicate the dependence on the metric. So I'm, I'm realizing circle. I mean, I could have rescaled the Riemannian metric, but I'm just writing the circle as R mod uh, L times Z instead of R times Z and see how this depends on L. The Plusian is then still the same. Uh, and the, the, the P forms look like this. You have smooth functions with this uh, periodicity property. So now we can solve everything. The eigenfunctions looks like, look like this. Uh, the eigen, um, eigenvalue for this eigenfunction is this. So the spectrum is this, 
and whenever two of them are equal, we can multiplicity. So we have a we have a very interesting spectrum of this Laplace operator. So we can compute the zeta function. We can take its derivative at zero. We can, we can write down the formula for any torsion really explicitly, and the outcome is this. If rho is a trivial representation, so if alpha is in two pi z, then torsion is one over l, depending on depending on l. If alpha is not in two pi z, which is what we saw, then cohomology vanishes. Then we get this number, which is independent of l. So in this example, we really see that analytic torsion depends on the Romanian metric or on the size of the circle in case cohomology is not zero. But if cohomology is zero, then we get a number which is independent of, um, of the size. So this illustrates that property. Okay. This is just, uh, this slide is a reinterpretation of analytic torsion, which, which will link back to, um, to an important theorem about analytic torsion. This is just some interpretation, just some linear algebra and calculus. If we have infinite dimensions, if we have a positive definite matrix A, we can define this zeta function. And then it's a nice exercise in first year calculus and first year in, uh, linear algebra that the determinant of the, of the matrix is this. That means for the right hand side, uh, we can replace A by this Laplacian, which is of course an infinite dimensional space. The right hand side still makes sense. And we, we can define the left hand side as the right hand side if we, if we leave out the kernel. So we, we could make this definition if we wanted to. If you then take the definition of analytic torsion in terms of this, we'll get a product of determinants raised to some power. Now, why would you do this? It's, it's an interpretation of, of this number, but this actually motivated Ray and Singer, I think, because they wanted to do the following. They wanted to, to do an analytic construction of Ray of Rydermaster front torsion. This is something from the 1930s. What they did is you have a compact manifold, take a triangulation of that manifold, and from that triangulation, you construct some finite dimensional cells, finite dimensional uh, chain complex, which has a, has a boundary map that I'm calling D tilde, also okay. twisted by representation row. From that boundary map and some formal adjoint, <laughs> the formula plus operator. Now a determinant is just really well defined because it's just a finite dimensional space. And they defined the notion of torsion as this alternating product of determinants, which looks a lot like this. So, so Ray and Singer wanted to find an, an analytic way. To, to construct this number, just like the RAM cohomology is an analytic way to construct cohomology. They, they didn't prove the equality, uh, which was uh, highly non trivial. This was proved by Chigo and Miller, Miller independently in the late uh, 1970s that this um, analytic version of torsion really equals this um, combinatorial version of torsion, right? Master France torsion. Uh, this was applied, for example, to, to classify lens spaces. So this is a, this is a refined topological invariant that was used for things. This theorem has been generalized in different directions, for example, to, to more general representations both by Bismuth and Zhang and by Miller in the, in the early 90s. So this was what motivated Ray and Singer, and, and this turned out to actually be a good idea because it's equality holds. Okay, this is what I want to say about Analytic torsion. Are there any questions? Any more questions about this? If not, then I'll move on to the Rogel zeta function, which at first is a completely different independent notion. Uh, the Rogel zeta function is something it's, it's something dynamical. It's about a flow on a, on a compact map. So I'm looking at a what I mean by a flow is a, just a smooth action by by the real line on N. I'm assuming it has no fixed points. And still assuming M is compact. The idea behind this zeta function is to find some regularized way to count periodic flow curves of this flow phi. Um, I'm going to make this precise in a second, but the idea is we want, to, we want to count how many periodic flow curves there are in some topological way, which means invariant under some perturbations, also twisted by the representation row, we just get more different kinds of, of invariants. Um, uh, the thing is, if you if you count periodic flow curves in a literal sense, if you have one periodic curve, you can also go around it two times, three times, or four times, etc. So you get infinitely many of them. So you have to regularize this in some way. So this is what this is about. 
I'm going to uh, write down the sum of a, of a periodic flow curves in a second, and um, I'm going to split up the sum into flow curves of different periods. So I just introduce some notation. The length spectrum just means all possible periods of flow curves of this flow phi. So all positive numbers for which this is true for some n. Now, given such an L, a, a possible period of a possible flow curve, I'll denote the set of flow curves with that period by gamma L phi. What I mean by modulo well constant time shifts is the following thing. Um, suppose we have um, a closed flow curve, so gamma, um, and, and suppose this is gamma of zero. Instead of starting here, I could also start here and I would get another closed flow curve, but that doesn't really add much. So I want to mod out by shifting the starting point of the flow curve. That's what I mean by um, modular constant time shifts. That means I mod out by shifting the starting point of the flow curve. I'm going to define uh, this relativity function in a special case under an extra assumption, uh, just for simplicity, but also because that's, that's the case where we're able to generalize to the variant setting, as I'll, as I'll talk about uh, later. I'm going to assume this non-degeneracy condition on phi, which means that if you have a, a closed flow curve gamma of period L, <coughs> this phi L is a map from, from M to itself, and it fixes gamma naught. That's, that's the, the property of having period L. Um, so the derivative of that on the, on the tangent spaces uh, maps the tangent space um, at gamma null to itself. And I'm looking at the plus one eigenspace of that map. It contains, it's a short computation, it contains the span of the derivative of, of gamma prime. And the condition is that's the only part of it. So there's no more, the, the plus one eigenspace of this map on, on, on uh, t gamma null to n is only this. That simplifies a few things. For example, if that's true, then for every possible period, this set of flow curves with that period is countable, which helps if you want to sum over it. I'll give um, I'll give some special cases of this, by the way. I'll give special cases and examples later, which where this is satisfied. Now, under that condition, we have a definition. Uh, it's, it's a whole slide wide, so let's just have a look at it. Supposing that this length spectrum is countable and we have this on a generous condition, then the function, uh, depending on phi and rho, is the following. We sum over all possible periods and then we sum over all periodic curves of that period. Um, I'm, I'm putting this factor here, which depends only on the period L. So I'm dividing by L, I'll, I'll come back to that later. And the idea is to, to put this, this expo exponential to the negative LZ as a regularizing factor. So the hope is that for Z with large real parts, this will help make this converge. And I'm summing over all the, the closed curves of that period. There is a plus, plus or minus one uh, sign here, which is the following. The non-degeneracy condition implies that um, this map is invertible orthogonally to, to, um, to the derivative of, of gamma. So as a determinant, which is not zero, I'm taking the sign of that. Um, I'm taking the trace of rho, because gamma is a closed curve. So it defines an element of the fundamental group. So I can apply rho to it and get the trace. And then this number here is the primitive period, which is the first time where the, the curve ends up back where it started. That's, that's, that's this thing. So the first, the first time where gamma comes back to itself. So L is some possibly later time that also comes back to itself. So what we have here, this combination of the primitive period divided by L, this is one over the multiplicity of gamma. So if, if say the first time gamma comes back to where it started is after time three, then 21 is also a period of that, of that curve if you go around it seven times. In this situation, um, L would be 21, and this would be three. So this divided by this is one over seven, which is one over this multiplicity. So basically, I'm allowing, I'm, I'm incorporating the fact that, that closed curves can go around themselves several times, but I'm compensating for that by dividing by this multiplicity in every term. 
two comments on this is um, um, for what it's worth, these terms, for example, the sign looks a bit like something in the idea about fixed point formula, so it looks a little bit topological. And as I said before, it's not the generous condition is not needed. If you don't assume that, you have to put some extra, extra, you have to replace this by something else and you get some extra uh, factors in there. But uh, I'm only focusing on this case for now. So this is, okay, you take the exponent, the, the X of that. It's on the one hand, it's a convention. On the other hand, uh, we want to talk about meromorphic continuation of this. And in cases where this thing is a log of something, by taking the X, you cancel the log and you avoid some issues with meromorphic continuation if you had a log of something. Okay, so this is something that you can also write down and I haven't really... Uh, Sorry, I may have a question. Sure. Could you explain the appearance of this exponential e to the power minus lz? Mm -hmm. What is the role of this exponential? The role is, um, well, the reason to include it is that we hope that if the real part of z is large, this will help um, help this converge. So if, if, we, if we did nothing, if we just took z is zero, this will diverge in general. It will just be a sum of infinitely many closed curves of, of, of certain terms and we'll, we'll get infinity. So I'm going to come back to this in special cases later. But if if um, the hope is that for Z with large real part, this will help this whole thing converge. And the next step is then to meromorphically extend it to Z equals zero. And, and that value can then be somehow interpreted as some kind of sum over or X, X, X over sum over all closed curves. Does, it, does that answer the question? Yeah, so I wonder about, because the geometry of, of this uh, picture is uh, somehow uh, hidden in the dependence on L. If you are taking this uh, exponential, you are taking something like, like uh, the Laplace transform of it. So I had an impression that, that this may be significant, maybe for some functional equation, I don't know what. Could be, could be, yeah. Um, of course, it, it makes this conversion better, but yeah, yeah. But why? I mean, why this? Why this specific factor? Is the question. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Well, what is this? Yeah. yeah. Well, may, maybe I'll, I'll mention some special cases where this does the job, and maybe that will clarify a little bit. Um, yeah, this is Anstor flows. So um, I had this non-degeneracy condition, but a, an important special case of that is Anstor flows, and that means this. It means that we, so I'm taking the u to be the vector field which generates phi. Anosov means that the tangent bundle to m splits up into three parts, namely the, the, the part spanned by this vector field, and the stable and an unstable part. And the stable and unstable parts are defined by exponential um, convergence or divergence if you when you apply the derivative of your flow. So if you have, let's, let's take the plus case. If you have a vector V plus in this plus, this E plus part, then for positive T, so you flow of a positive T and take the derivative of that and apply it to V plus, that should converge exponentially to zero. And the other component is where you take, you put minus signs everywhere. So you flow to minus infinity and then in that direction, it should converge to zero. So this is a stronger condition than non-degeneracy. Um, non-degeneracy meant that the plus one eigenspace of the derivative of the flow was just this. Now, this, what I wrote here, really means that this, these don't have one as an eigenspace, as an eigenvalue. Um, but also, this condition is about the whole tangent bundle. And then the non-degeneracy condition is only about looking at closed curves. But anyway, this is a, a slightly stronger condition. And in this setting, what I wrote down, this well zeta function really has nice properties. To begin with, uh, convergence. So if we have an Anosov flow, then it follows that this length spectrum is countable, and also that the, the number of flow curves with, with period at most r grows at most exponentially in r. So if we take this whole sum, um, if, if this is big enough, we have a bunch of terms here. So, so this together is at most uh, one. This is absolute value 
bounded, this is plus minus one. So if there are at most exponentially many curves with a period up to R, then by taking this Z very large, real part very large, this will converge. So in the in the Anosov case, uh, if you take the real part of Z large, you will at least get a convergent expression. Now there's some very deep results on the Anosov case. Um, first of all, meromorphic continuation. This is a paper in the annals, very, very uh, deep result. If M is an orientable compact manifold, they have an Anosov flow, then this doesn't only converge on this part of the complex plane with large real part, but meromorphically extends to C. And then another result, which is an Inventionis paper, um, well, they proved more than this, but uh, it's in the paper. In that case, uh, so this meromorphically extends to C. Uh, if the value at, at zero is well defined, so if it doesn't have a pole or something at, at, at zero, then this is invariant under some, some notion of homotopy. I'm mentioning this because uh, I said that we want to kind of topologically count closed curves, and this is kind of an ex expression of that topological nature of the, of the counting. And these are all uh, difficult results. So for the Anosov case, in any case, uh, there are some nice properties of this function, and we can actually talk about its value at zero, and this is a nice kind of invariant thing. I'm mentioning this because it will come back later. Um, the proofs of both of these things, this is very analytical, and they're based on, on an expression for this function in terms of some distributional trace, which I'm not going to go into very deeply, but I'm mentioning it now because I'm going to come back to it later. Okay, here's an important special case of an Anosov flow, namely a geodesic flow on the sphere bundle of a negatively curved manifold. What we're doing is the following. We're taking a compact Riemannian manifold X, and we're taking the unit sphere bundle inside its tangent bundle, so, which is our manifold M. On that M, we have geodesic flow. What that means is, this is the formula, what it means is an element of M is a unit a tangent vector. We take the geodesic flow in that direction, geodesic in that direction, and then you take the derivative of that, which you apply to tangent vectors. So you basically you take geodesic flow and the derivative of that um, apply to tangent vectors. This is the formula for that. And that's a flow on this unit sphere bundle in the, in the tangent bundle. And this is Anistov is if X is negative sectional curvature. And so in this case, you, some, you get something like closed geodesics, which is a, a worthwhile thing to count, which is a very geometric thing that you might want to count. So everything I said just now applies to this geodesic flow. And this is an important special case. Let's go back to the circle. So I'm taking the circle and the simplest possible non-trivial flow on that, just, just adding T. Um, it has one, one flow curve because it's just a circle. Uh, the the, the complement of the derivative of the flow curve is just nothing. So now we can write everything out and compute the rho zeta function. We're taking the, the same representation rho as before. The length spectrum is now the natural numbers because you can go around the circle once, twice, three times, etc. Um, <clears throat> for a given period, there's only one curve for that period. Come on. Well, what's written here is the determinant, the sign of the determinant of a map on the zero space. I don't know what that is, but let's call it one. Uh, and the primitive period is now just one because the first time you, you go back when you started is just time one. If you now write out the definition of this rho zeta function, we get this factor here, which depends just on the period L. The other factor is the sine is one, which is just summing over one curve, and we just get this factor here, which comes from the representation rho. Now, if you recognize the Taylor series with the log of one plus x, you can see that this function just becomes this very efficient function in this case. Circle is nice, we just compute everything. Now, I've now talked about analytic torsion and about neural zeta function. Um, the reason I'm talking about both of those things is that there's a relation between them, which is Freed's conjecture. The conjecture of Freed is that if the cohomology is zero, then for many flows, which is a non-rigorous uh, non statement, uh, this function extends to, to zero, and the absolute value there equals analytic torsion. This is always a positive number. Um, 
this value at zero is not necessarily positive, but if you take the absolute value, it equals this. Uh, this large class of flows is more of an invitation to look at classes of flows where it's true. There are counterexamples. So, so it's the problem is to, to find conditions under which this holds. And this has been proved in many cases by many people uh, since, since the late 70s. So this is just possibly an incomplete list, but people have had results equating this, uh, proving these things are equal in many different situations. The original result from free that, that motivated this was the case where M is a hyperbolic, uh, compact hyperbolic manifold, so negatively curved, and you take a geodesic flow on this unit sphere bundle. And then Fried proved in 86 that this is true and then stated the conjecture uh, later. This is a very um, active area with lots of different results in singular cases, etc. lots of different uh, difficult theorems about this. So they are related, those two, those two notions. And I want to talk about, oh, I want to, of course, uh, say what this is for the circle. Um, in the case of the circle with this representation row, we now combine our computations from before. If alpha is not in two pi z, which means cohomology is zero, uh, analytic torsion was this uh, this number, and um, the value at zero of the Royal Zeta function was this thing without the absolute value, and these two. So this, in general, without the absolute value, this is not uh, positive. But if you take the absolute value, they, they are really equal. Take out a factor e to the one half alpha, and they are equal. So it's true for the circle, which is which is nice to see. Okay. In the time that's left, I want to talk about how to generalize all of this to an equivariant setting. I'll start with analytic torsion. <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the 90s, there were lots of papers about this, where people included group actions and looked at how, how can you define an, an equivariant version of analytic torsion that incorporates group action somehow. In the cases people looked at in the 90s were uh, two, two types of cases, either the group was finite or compact, or look at a compact manifold, take a universal cover, and let the, the fundamental group of the compact manifold at the universal cover. The idea behind most of these, not all of them, but behind most of these constructions is to replace the operator trace, which is used in the definition of analytic torsion, by some equivariant version that I'll uh, discuss now. But first, the, the conditions. So I'm now allowing M to be non-compact. Um, I'm now looking at a unimodular D group G acting properly on M. So properly means that the map from G times M to M times M defined by this is proper. Uh, the action should be isometric and orientation preserving. And I want the quotient of the action to be compact. Just like um, I'll mention some special cases now uh, in, on the next slide. I'm also going to fix an element of the group and call it centralizer Z. And I'm going to assume that uh, there's a measure on the quotient, which is equivalent to Z being uh, unimodular itself, because G is unimodular. So I'm going to fix an element and then um, yeah, fix a measure on G modulo its centralizer. Some special cases. Uh, oh, okay. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. yes. Could you come back to this definition? Uh, so the quotient M mod G is compact, it means that it's a topological space. You don't assume about this topological space anything else? Well, because the action is proper, the quotient is a uh, household. So, so M, M, is a man, M is a manifold. M is a manifold. Yeah. And yeah. if the action is proper, action is proper and this, this quotient is a household space. Household space, yeah. Yeah. And uh, oh, no, you are assume, assuming something. The, the quotient, uh, okay, only with respect to the centralizer of, of some oh, element. This is, this is different. So, so this is this... an invariant measure. Yeah. So, uh, so on this quotient. Uh -huh. so we're looking at two quotients, the quotient of M by G, which is compact, but mm -hmm. not necessarily a manifold. If, if the action is free, it's a manifold, but not in general. And this is not a quotient, but I'm just taking a measure. But um, clarify things. How how frequently in practice this quotient the G mod V uh, is an at least an orbifold? This one? 
is an orbit. Oh yes, it's a compact group. So uh, these uh, the centralizer. It's not compact. Um, uh, uh, ah, yeah, but why? Why do you say G is compact? Again? Yeah, G is not compact. G is non compact. Non compact. Oh yes, yes. So therefore, yeah. it's not so obvious that this G mod Z uh, even uh, can have this uh, G invariant matter. That's true. Yeah, th this is true. It, um, if Z is unimodular, then it does. If not, it. so it's an assumption. Okay. So it's and a serious assumption here. It's a serious assumption. Important it assumption. Uh, okay. It is, I'll, I'll give some examples now. So the compact case, uh, everything is yeah. not. Yeah, so it is compact, of course. <laughs> yes. So in, the, in the compact case, the action, the, if the action preserves everything, the action is proper, and then everything is. <laughs> Uh, in the case where you take a, a compact manifold and you consider the universal cover acted on by the fundamental group, then also this is, this is all true. Now, in, in the case of a discrete group, this is fine because we just have a discrete set, so we just take a counting measure. So for discrete groups, this, this measure is fine. Uh, and the last special case, which is also relevant, if, you, if N is a Romanian um, homogeneous space of a reductive G group, so quotient of a vector group by a compact group. You take a co-compact subgroup of that group, which is the one acting, either the whole group, for example, or some co-compact discrete subgroup. Then um, in cases where G is a semi-simple element, mm -hmm. that measure exists. It exists a bit more generally, but G being semi-simple is enough for that. So there are relevant cases where, where those assumptions are true and this measure on G mod Z does exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Given all of this, uh, this is the trace that I'm going to use to replace the operator trace. It turns out because the action is proper and the quotient is compact, there exists a smooth complex support function chi with this property. So the integral over every orbit is one. Basically, if, if this, if this are your, if these are your orbits, you would like chi to do something like this, to be kind of cut off on every orbit. And this can be done in a co-compact, sorry, in a, for kind of a compact support because the, the quotient is compact. Um, so the, I'm choosing a, a high measure here, of course. So um, given a function chi like this, suppose we have <clears throat> a, um, a G equivariant vector bundle over N, G equivariant emission vector bundle, and we look at the L2 space of sections and a G invariant bounded operator on that space. Now, in general, if M is not compact, it'll be difficult for T itself to be trace class. Um, but there is more hope that T composed with multiplication by the scatter function chi is trace class. Supposing that's the case, that T composed with chi is trace class, we can write down this trace for every uh, group element X. So we're taking all the conjugates of our element G. This is again trace class. And we can take this integral, which might diverge. If G mod Z is not compact, this might diverge. But if it converges, we call this the G trace. Some special cases. Oh. Yeah, and then this doesn't this doesn't depend on the chi is one basic property. Uh, the second property is that if you call it a trace, you would like to say that the trace of TS equal to the trace of ST. This is true, but the conditions are a bit subtle. Um, it's, for example, if, if this converges for one operator, it's not even clear if it converges for the square of the operator. So, so it's a bit, bit subtle, but it has a trace-like property. Uh, sorry, sorry, could you come back to this uh, independence of the choice of this cutoff function? Yeah. Uh, mm, could you repeat what is the reason why it is independent of, of the choice of cutoff function? Um, it's a short computation that involves uh, for being uh -huh. uh, it's a short argument. It's it's it's, it's a quick lemma. Yeah, it's not, not very difficult. It's just some substitutions and uh, for being and, and oh yeah, for it. So this cutoff function it's it's arbitrary function of the smooth function of compact support with this property. Yeah, satisfying this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Some special cases here. Um, this is the definition of, the, of this G trace. Um, if you take the identity element, then the centralizer is everything. So G mod Z is just one element. So there's no integral over uh, the G mod Z. 
So you only get a trace of T composed with tau, which is the von Neumann trace used by Atia, for example, in L2 index theorem. That's a special case. And in the compact case, this, we can take this function chi to be constant one. If you normalize the volume of G to be zero, so if you take um, chi to be one here, then this is true if the volume of G is zero, this is one. And then this, this whole thing just becomes uh, a volume factor times a trace of G composed with T. So there are some special cases. Now, um, in the definition of analytic torsion, there was a zeta function. And it looked like this. This was a zeta function, which had an operator trace in it. The idea is to replace the operator trace by this G trace. But uh, we don't want to, to do that in this formula directly here, because it's not so clear that the G trace converges here in special cases. We want to rewrite this in terms of the heat operator, which is, which is better to work with. And it's a, it's a quick lemma that the, um, the zeta function, the zeta function can be written like this as a, as a Mellon transform of the trace of the heat operator. I'm now projecting out this, this projection here is the projection onto the kernel of, of the Laplacian. So I'm projecting out, this is the same thing as saying we restricted the orthogonal complement of the kernel of this Laplacian. Um, yeah, so this, this trace of the minus S power of the Laplacian can be rewritten as this Mellon transform, that Mellon transform expression. This has the heat kernel in it, which is a bit nicer to work with. It's smooth and everything. Uh, if you write out this, now there's an integral here, which, which um, raises some convergence questions. There's a convergence question near zero and near infinity. Near zero, this converges because um, the trace of the heat operator, um, I'm, I'm guessing I'm looking at the case where this kernel is uh, zero. Well, in any case, the small time asymptotics for the trace of the heat operator is just t to the minus n over two. So if the real part of S is bigger than n over two, is a converge near zero. And the, the, the integral converges near, towards infinity because of Weyl's law. This trace is just uh, the sum over of the positive eigenvalues. And because the, the, these, these go to infinity in a certain way, we have fast decay in time. So we always have convergence as, as t goes to infinity. But there's no convergence issues in compact case for the one set. Sorry, so if I understand well, uh, this means that uh, if all this cohomology vanishes, mm -hmm. then this projection is zero. Yes, so, that's right. So this so, formula simplifies. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and here I'm actually looking at the case where cohomology vanishes. I think. <laughs> Um, okay, I want to change. I want to change notation or assumption a little bit before I go on. Um, in the in the classical case, I, I twisted by this row and this, this representation row with fundamental group gives us a flat vector bundle with a flat connection. Um, and I actually, that those, those two things are equivalent, giving a representation of a flat vector bundle or a flat, flat vector bundle with a flat connection. I'm now because I'm having the, have the G action here. I want to just start with a flat vector bundle with a flat connection instead of starting with this row. So I'm going to now assume that we have a G equivariant permission flat vector bundle on M, I'm going with F, and a flat connection, which is G invariant, uh, preserves the metric on that bundle. Then uh, that extends to, to P forms, going from P forms to P plus one forms. Again, we can use the, the Hodge star to, to define a formal adjoint of that operator. And uh, I'm now going to look at a uh, Laplace operator again, but now defining it in terms of that um, connection. And as I said, in the in the classical case where there's no group action, this is the same, this is given by, by this representation rho. So in that case, uh, rho was given, rho defines this vector bundle over M and this connection uh, on, on, on that vector bundle. So I'm just changing the way I present this now. I'm going to now view on view things depending on this connection, nebula F, rather than depending on rho. So now we have this Laplace operator. And uh, if you want to somehow define analytic torsion and the zeta function, we would like this to have a well-defined G trace, uh, which turns out to be true in the case where G mod is compact, 
the integral over G mod Z is not an issue uh, for discrete groups or semi-simple groups. This also turns out to converge. Uh, this projection here may or may not be G trace class, uh, but we're looking at cases later where this projection is zero. So then in, the, in, the, in those settings, this G trace is well defined. Okay, so um, I'm going to comment on convergence later, but for now, assuming all convergence uh, is, is okay, I'm gonna generalize the derivative of the zeta function that was used in the definition of uh, analytic torsion. I'm going to, so in this, uh, in the classical setting, the zeta function could be expressed in this way. And convergence towards infinity was not an issue because this thing decays exponentially, so always compensates for this behavior. In the non-compact case, where there's a group acting, the, the convergence towards infinity is more subtle. So I'm going to split up this integral. I'm going to only use this expression for the integral from zero to some finite value. I'm going to take it to be one. And for large t, I'm going to not include this s part to help with convergence. So, so this is what I said near for, for the integral from zero to one, I'm putting this uh, S regularization in there. Um, I'm going to assume that this converges for S with large real part and extends meromorphically to zero. And uh, for the integral from one to infinity, I'm going to not put in this T to the S in this thing. And the reason for that is that this thing might only go very slowly to zero or not or you know, even be bounded. So just to help with convergence towards um, T is in, for T to infinity. Then I will um, define, this notation is maybe a bit funny because I haven't defined zeta itself yet, but this expression on the right generalizes the derivative of the zeta function in the classical case. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to S equals zero uh, of this, this integral from zero to one and just adding the integral over here. This doesn't depend on where you cut off. I'm cutting off at, at the value one here. It doesn't matter. Um, if you integrate from, from A to B, where A and B are both positive, it turns out that this here um, just drops out. So this is independent of where you cut off. And really generalizes um, the same thing in the classical case. Sorry, I have a question. Maybe I missed this. Uh... But uh, what guarantees us that, that this uh, derivative exists? Yeah, um, so this is, I'm not defining the function itself. I'm just, notation is just the derivative of zeta without saying what zeta is. I'm defining it to be the right-hand side because this generalized derivative of zeta in the, in the compact case. So I'm going to talk about convergence in a second. But I'm, only, I'm just going to assume for now that this is all well defined. So I'm assuming that this converges. Yeah. So for ah, now, so, it's... so you say that this first condition guarantees that only this convergence guarantees that uh, for sufficiently large uh, real part of S, this uh, normalized integral is a differentiable function of S. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming two things here. I'm assuming it converges for S with large real part. And that it extends meromorphically to the complex plane. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood you. you. And in which sense you mean this? Uh, do you mean this this uh, derivative? Uh, this derivative. The usual sense of derivative, or some in some weak sense. What is this? It's the actual derivative of a meromorphic. Actual function. derivative. Mm -hmm. so, so you are assuming that this is differentiable. Right. You are assuming that this is differentiable. So I'm assuming it's a it's a meromorphic function, which is regularly yeah. zero. So hence differential. And regular mu zero. Yeah. But okay. I'll, I'll I'll mention a result on this in a few slides. Okay, regular mu zero means that uh, okay, the, the only problem could be around zero. Yeah, so there's no single. I'm if it's good zero. around zero, then this is differentiable. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But I'll come back to it. May I also ask? What's the, the reason for the second term in the definition of the zeta function? Uh, this term? Yeah. It turns out that in the in the classical case where n is compact, uh -huh. uh, these two, um, okay, in the case where n is compact. You say, I, you say I'm still seeing it after a while. 
Yes, yes. So, so in the case where M is compact, you can just put dds s equals zero here, one over gamma s, and then put an s there. So then okay. the s becomes one, one, one big integral. Um, and then you really recover the, the derivative of the zeta, zeta function in the classical sense because of this uh, little computation. Well, this computation here says that that gives back. So if you take TDS here, you get back the derivative of the zeta function. But now I'm, I just have one integral. It turns out that in the in the classical case, if you stay away from zero, so, so this regularization here is only needed near zero. You, you want this S to have large real part for the, the S equals zero behavior. Away from zero, it's a very short calculus computation that this just drops out and it's the same. Mm -hmm. So yes, in the in the classical case, you, you see this part. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, so here is the um, just I repeated the definition of this derivative of the zeta function uh, zero, and now I'm just um, repeating the same definition of analytic torsion, but now replacing the the derivative of zeta by the thing I just defined. So with this notation then the definition looks a lot the same. That's why I made this definition here. Um, notation is slightly different. Before I wrote tau rho, uh, sorry, t rho of m. Now I'm writing tg of nabla f because I'm seeing this as depending on the connection nabla f rather than uh, representation rho. Okay. Um, yes, but there's, there's convergence issues. It's convergence problems for this, for so we have, we have two integrals here, this and this. Uh, so for both of them, you can ask, does it converge? Now, small time convergence turns out to be reasonably manageable. Uh, and I'm, I'm stating it imprecisely here, but on a, on a reasonably mild, mild assumptions using heat, um, heat kernel um, asymptotics, this integral really converges for S with large real part. And it extends meromorphically to to uh, to C, and is regular near S equals zero. So this is not not that much different from the the meromorphic extension is not that much different from the classical arguments using heat kernel and some topics. Um, the proof of convergence for um, large real part of S is you you split up the estimates in, in two parts: um, a compact neighborhood of the identity coset where uh, classical arguments apply because your set is compact. And outside the set, you have some decay behavior uh, using certain uh, normal estimates. I have a question yes. about these mild assumptions. Mm -hmm. Are they about uh, the metric? Are they about this flat bundle? Mm -hmm. Are they about the action or, or maybe yeah, about it's a, everything? Uh, fair question. Um, it's, it's really about this Schwarz-Milner here, which is about the, the, the link between the distance in the group and the distance on the manifold. So in the case where the, where the, the group is discrete, uh, the Schwarz-Milner lemma says that if you take a, a point in the manifold, act on it by, by a group element, then the distance that you travel can be estimated below by the length of the group element. Mm -hmm. And that type of estimate is what we need. And that is true in the where, where, where G is discrete, that's always true. Uh, where G is a Lie group, it is also true on certain conditions. Where G is Lie group. Uh, yeah, if G is connected, for example, if G okay. is either connected Lie group or a discrete group, then it's true. So this is only about the action and the metric. That's right. Yeah, and the distance yeah. in the group, distance in the and the, the, there are no restrictions for the for this uh, flat bundle, for instance. Well, it has to be everything has to be G invariant, right? So, so the, the so the the connections, yeah. the metric on the bundle is G invariant. So, so it's kind of controlled by the group action in some way. Yeah. So, so um, my point of this is convergence of this small time integral is usually okay. Convergence of the large time integral. It's, it's much harder to say something, even in well-known cases. So this integral for uh, for large t, you would like this to decay slightly better than, than uh, to, uh, some negative power of, of t, for example. Now, this is not generally 
it is often true, but uh, it was often in the case where you look at the universal cover of a compact manifold and G is the identity element. Um, it turns out that the decay rate in some sense is an invariant, which is a Novikov Schumann invariant. They were long, um, it was long conjectured that this decay rate is just, is always just good enough to make this converge, but the, the, then later people found counterexamples. So convergence of this integral depends on the decay rate of this, which is generally, uh, is often the case, but not in general. So this is, there is a, an assumption there. Okay, uh, some special cases of this notion of torsion. In the compact case, people look at equivariant torsion, and then, then of course, there are no convergence issues. Uh, the spectrum is still discrete, everything still works out. A lot of people study the compact case and prove things about them, like uh, Chica Muller theorems, uh, et cetera. This was done in the 1990s. In the case where you have a compact manifold X and universal cover M, acted on by the fundamental group of X, and people looked at this uh, in different settings. In, in the early 90s, uh, both Lot and Matai considered the case for the identity element and just a trivial bundle with a trivial connection. And then they, they constructed this number, which uh, they call L2 analytic torsion, because then this is just a Riemann trace, so it fits in the, it's also used in the ATS L2 um, in the theorem. Slightly more generally, if the conjugacy class or G multi is finite, and then also for the trivial one on trivial connection, Lot considered this uh, case called the localized analytic torsion. And the case for the identity element was later studied by uh, Su for general manifolds and groups. And he also proved some things about uh, this number. In all these cases, uh, G mod Z was compact. If G mod Z is not compact, then there are several difficulties because there's an integral over G mod Z in the definition of the G trace. But this is a very restrictive assumption. So our goal was to, first of all, unify these things, but also to, to, to extend to the case where G mod Z may be non-compact, which is yeah, in many cases. Yeah, so, so a lot of people prove things about this, for example, Chica Muller theorem. So, so they developed equivariant versions of Ray of, of um, the master front torsion to improve the quality that they have notions of analytic torsion. Let's go back to the circle. Yeah. Um, okay, look at the circle of circumference L and the circle group acting on it by rotation. We look at the associated bundle uh, F associated to that uh, representation and then the same connection as before. If alpha is not uh, in two pi z, so this representation row is not trivial. As we saw before, for the identity element, we just get, get that classical analytic torsion, which is this number that we computed before. And for a non-trivial group element of the circle, we get we again get some expression. If um, well, this is something we saw before. If alpha is uh, in two pi z, then this torsion depends on circumference. And I didn't put an expression for the for non-trivial group elements here. We can now also handle a non-compact manifold. So let's look at the simplest example there, which is a line acting on the line. Uh, again, to, to illustrate the dependence on the metric, let's look at the metric um, L squared dx squared. We let the line act on this trivial bundle, but with this non-trivial action. And we take the, the trivial connection on, on that uh, line bundle. Now it turns out that um, analytic torsion at the identity element of R is one, and for a non-identity element, it's still computable here. And the interesting thing is that in this case, um, well, in this case, the group is abelian, so G mod Z, uh, the simplicity of always everything, so there's no convergence issues. Sorry, okay. just a stupid question. Why did you betray the circle for the sake of a line? Oh, because I, I want to show that we can now handle non-compact manifolds. And so, uh, um, just want to be non-compact. Yes. No, yeah. yeah so this is just an example, the simplest example of a non-compact group acting on a non-compact manifold with a compact quotient. Okay. Just an example. A less trivial example is hyperbolic three-dimensional space. Uh, we look at the group, the connected component of SO31. 
acted on hyperbolic three-dimensional space, which is the quotient of that group by SO3. And the group element I'm taking is a, is a, a rotation a G, some, somewhere in SO2. Well, of course, every group element of SO3 of the three lies in some SO2 over a non-trivial angle, and I'm going to angle X. I'm taking a trivial bundle and trivial connection, and then it's a bit of a longer argument to compute the um, equivariant torsion for that, which turns out to have this expression. And the proof of this equality is using uh, a formula by Bismuth for all the input places of heat kernels. And this is still computable and convergent. Now, some properties of this. Um, dependence on the metric. This is something that, that Ray and Singer proved that it's actually invariant independent of the metric in case cohomology vanishes. Um, so does this notion, is this independent of the metric? This is proved by earlier versions of endothelial torsion um, for, for finite conjugacy classes and compact conjugacy classes. In the non-compact case, there's, there's, a, there's more subtle things going on. There's a bit of an interplay between the volume growth of G mod Z and the large time behavior of, of traces of heat kernels. And, and yeah, these things have to be taken into account. Um, there's not so much known about these things. There's some results, but the way traces of G traces of heat kernels decay is, is, uh, is there's not so much known about it. In any case, um, we had to, we could, we could only prove metric independence on under some conditions. So not stating the matricity, but supposing that the L2 kernel of this Laplacian is trivial, just like in, in a compact case, we would like the cohomology to vanish. Under some conditions, which, which are somewhat restricted, which depend on the volume growth of this and on the large time behavior of heat kernels, uh, we have convergence of equivariant and metric torsion and independence of the metric. Uh, there's some special cases where this, where this is all true. The case where G mod is compact is, uh, is fine. We only need these Novik of Schubin invariants to be positive, which you also need in the, in the previous cases, concern, um, previous settings where this was considered. Um, there's another special case where M is simply connected and the Laplace is actually invertible rather than just having trivial kernel under some some volume growth conditions on GMOT, like polynomial volume growth or some small, slow exponential volume growth. This is also true. And this is also, this is a bit vague, but metrics, if you have a two metrics in the same path component of some space of metrics with a certain curvature condition, this is also true. So it's a bit of a subtle thing to have metric independence, but in any case, for GMOT compact, uh, this is this is good, and um, torsion doesn't depend on the metric. For G mod Z not compact, it's a bit more subtle and a bit more subtle conditions. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the last condition. Is this condition uh, fulfilled uh, automatically in the homogeneous case or not? No. Uh, let's see. Well, they they're more likely to have negative curvature, so I think uh, this is not really that that well. Positive well, curvature condition is close to, to something being uh, homogeneous. Okay. I'm sorry. So for homogeneous spaces, the, uh, the curvature condition is uh, positive curvature condition is fulfilled, I suppose. Well, for G mod K, that's 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 not positively curved. So. Ah yes yeah 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 yeah. So, so, so it's not really that suitable for that. So, yeah, there are conditions. I'm just, I want to say there are conditions, but it's a bit subtle, a bit of a subtle question for non compact G model. Yes. Now, some other properties of, of analytic torsion, which also hold in this case um, triviality for even dimensional manifolds, it's still true. Uh, if it converges, it has to be trivial for even dimensional manifolds. And again, there's some kind of product formula. Where now um, the only characteristic that was there in the in the product formula in the compact case is now some equivariant version of all characteristic, but it still generalizes. Um, okay. Now we have fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Now, the second part is the, the real zeta function. How, how to make that equivalent. I'm going to um, assume that phi is a flow as before, but now I'm going to assume that the flow map phi t commutes with the group action. And two, two uh, examples are if you have a Ramanian manifold acted on by a group, which preserves the metric, then we can take a geodesic flow on the sphere bundle as before, and that satisfies this assumption by a quick calculation. And also, if you have something, a flow on a compact manifold in it to universal cover, uh, that also satisfies the assumption. Now, I want to define uh, a version of the Royal Zeta function involving uh, the group action. So I'm, again, as before, fixing the group element G. So the, the main difference is that before we used to look at um, flow curves gamma, which um, ended where they started. What I'm going to do now is look at something like this. So this is gamma of zero. This is gamma of L. It should be uh, G acting on gamma of zero. So the idea is to replace closed curves periodic curves by, by curves with this property. That after some period L, you don't end up where you started, but you end up at G acting on where you started. So that's this condition over here. Again, I want to sum over all the curves with that property. So I'm, I'm um, as before, splitting up the sum into possible periods or possible Ls with this property and curves. So I'm going to get the G length spectrum. Um, the, all the now including non -neg including negative L for which there is a, is a point with that property. Why am I including negative L? Uh, this this is needed uh, as, I, as if I have time I'll mention this um, for an equivariant field conjecture. Um, just to indicate why it might be useful to, to include negative L in this case. Suppose we have R being acted on by R itself. And the flow, just the, the simple flow of translation by T. Then, if you have a group element in the real line, uh, non zero group element, the, the, because of this flow is so simple, the only L with that property, because now the left hand side is um, M, oh, this is M plus L, this is also M plus G. So, the only possible L is just G. And uh, G can be negative. So if G, if G is negative, we would like to include, to allow negative numbers L so you, so you get some information. <clears throat> Sorry, so by, by L negative, you mean that this path is oriented? So uh, it's, it's a curve. T goes, to, T goes to phi T of M. And T can now be a real number. So we can take T to be positive or negative. So do you understand? <laughs> no, 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 I don't understand either. Could you draw a picture similar to picture you do on the previous page? What do you mean by, by negative L? Well, this condition here. Is, is a condition that's, that has meaning for every L, right? Mm -hmm. So for every uh, real number L and every M and N, this is a point in the manifold, this is a point in the manifold. And we can ask the question if those two points are equal. And it's not necessary to, to only take positive L because this is always just defined. Um, okay, so, so you are regarding this L now as, as a parameter that's right and you are substituting to phi uh -huh. and and this is not related to to, to the length of the arc counted uh, into an opposite direction um yeah not really. so in, in the classical case where there's no g here of course yeah in the classical case the inverse phi, it could be g inverse sorry? yeah it could be yeah in the classical case if you have phi l of m equals m then also phi minus L of M equals M. It's their equivalent. In the classical case, yeah, okay. There's no information by only taking positive L. In the in this case, there might be different things happening for L and negative L. That's kind of what I'm saying. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so given one of those L's, I want to look at the curves gamma with that property. So the property that if you if you um, if you take the value at L, you end up with the group the element G acting on where you start. Again, modulo constant time shift is what I was saying earlier. I'm not, I'm not I'm identifying curves with different with the same starting point, but it's at the same curve. Um, I'm imposing a non-degeneracy condition, which is uh, in the classical case, this was that if you have a closed curve with period L, that this was this here was left out. So the kernel of one minus the tangent map the derivative of phi L was just this one-dimensional space. Now I'm putting a group element here. This is now needed because if you have this curve uh, gamma, this is gamma of zero, gamma of L, which is equal to G, gamma of zero. If you then apply G inverse, then you end up back where you started. So, so this thing here really goes from, or, or this map here, really fixes gamma naught. A small lemma, just like in previous in the classical cases, that under this condition, for any given L, this set of curves is countable, so we can sum over it. Of course, modular convergence questions. And now comes the, the so these generalizations were all rather straightforward. The only thing we had to do is uh, look at these kind of curves instead of just leaving out the G there. And what was kind of surprising to us, and maybe surprising to you as well when I say this, is that this primitive period was rather non-trivial to generalize. So in the classical case, the primitive period was the minimum the first time where the curve ended up back where it started. Um, in the case where you look at these kind of curves, you could do the, the thing which turns out not to work. You could, for example, take the smallest time where you don't end up back where you started, but you end up with G where you started. Um, what I'm about to say is not really an argument why this doesn't work. Um, but um, in the case where you take a flow or a compact manifold, you have to do universal cover. For example, in this picture, let's take uh, something on the torus, lift to the, to the plane, then the, these blue dots are just z squared. So it's z squared. Um, if you take this green curve on the torus, on, on the torus, it wraps around itself two times, but the primitive period here is just this period here. And uh, this may not be clear or convincing, but we would like to encode this, this primitive period on the, on the base manifold. For that reason, I, well, for, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I want to use a more um, subtle definition of this primitive period. So this was not, yeah, maybe not a hard argument, but okay. I'm going to do the following thing. Um, I'm again using uh, a cutoff function chi with this property just like before in definition of this trace that we used in the definition of um, analytic torsion. If you have a, a smooth curve in M, I'm going to look at an interval I gamma so that gamma on that interval is a bijection to its image. So in the case, well, I'm going to say, say this in a second, but in my in the case where there's no group acting, uh, this would just be the interval zero to the primitive period, for example. Okay. I'm defining a primitive period depending on chi as the integral over that uh, interval of the value of chi at your curve. And this seems to be a bit of a funny thing to do because it depends on the interval i gamma, it depends on the function chi, so it doesn't seem very clinical at all. But this turns out to be the thing that makes the definition work. Don't you assume that this uh, interval is the shortest one, in a sense? Let i be an interval such that gamma... Bijection. Uh, yes, it's a bijection to its image. Yeah, so in, in the... Oh, is it any, any such interval? Yeah, so this thing depends on i gamma. But I'm going to write out an expression later, and the total expression will not depend on those choices. And also... Uh, give a, a, a version of Fried's conjecture in, in have nice properties in general. So this is not so obvious right now. Just to clarify this a little bit, in a compact case, for example, that the group is trivial, you can normalize the high measure so that the volume uh, is one 
M is also compact now, and we take the, the cutoff function one. Now this I gamma, as I said earlier, we can just now take the interval from zero to the primitive period. And then what I just said is we, if we take the integral over that interval of your function, which is now constant one, and it now gives back the primitive period. So at least in the trivial case, um, in, the, in, the, in the case where the group is compact, we get back the actual primitive period. I realize I, I don't have a lot of time anymore, so I just want to reach the definition and then um, um, good. Um, yes, I think I'm going to maybe skip a few things. I just want to at least state the definition. In cases where um, this G length spectrum is countable, and we have this normal degeneracy condition, and we have this measure on this, on this quotient, I'm going to write down uh, a generalization of this Royal Zeta function. The difference is that I'm going to um, so in this length spectrum, I also allowed negative L. So I'm going to take an absolute value now. Uh, this sign of a determinant now involves the, the, the group element G. Um, we have this funny primitive period there that I put, put with a uh, group element H acting on gamma. And we take the trace. Uh, um, what this is here is that we take parallel transport defined by your connection going from the fiber of this flat vector bundle at the starting point to the end point, the inverse of that, then applying a group element to end, end up back when you start and make the trace of that. So this is a generalization in the sense of a classical Royal Zeta function. Um, there's some well-defined questions before we even talk about convergence. This um, primitive period that is here. So I'm integrating over G mod Z. And this is the only thing that depends on H. For this to be well, defi well defined in the first place, you would like this to be right Z invariant. So it's actually a function on G mod Z. This is actually the case, it's short lemma. But what's, um, yeah. what's less clear is that uh, this expression doesn't depend on the choice of chi or of this integral. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, what, I'll, what I'm going to do is um, lift the flow to the exterior powers of the code engine bundle tensor with this flat vector bundle by applying um, parallel transport in this component and just uh, pulling back along the flow in these exterior powers. Then uh, this is uh, uh, this was our central result in this paper. There's an expression for this Royal Zeta function in terms of the distributional trace. So I, I can't really go into it that much right now, but this distributional trace is a little bit like the G trace, but you replace the operator trace by integrating distributional Schwartz kernel over the diagonal. So you have an operator with a Schwartz kernel, which is a distribution in general, under condition of the wavefront set, you can restrict it to the, to the diagonal and integrate it. And if that all works out, so the statement is that this really works out. Um, this is an expression for the Royal Zeta function. And this implies because uh, this trace involves the cutoff function chi, but it's easy to show that it doesn't depend on chi. So this expression, uh, one consequence is that, that the choices we made don't, don't matter. Now, a little bit earlier, I said that all these uh, difficult analytical results on the classical Royal Zeta function started with some expression in terms of distributional trace, and that was the, the non equivariant version of this. So in the classical case, there's something called the Gilliman's trace formula, which is an expression like this without the G, and that's the basis of analytical arguments uh, involving the Royal Zeta function, which is another reason why we thought obtaining uh, an expression like this would be useful for possible further work to, to start with the analytical arguments here. I want to uh, not talk too much anymore, so I, I now, Claim that uh, so we have a definition of this Royal Zeta function in the in the in the G case. Um, the next question is: Is there a version of Fried's conjecture? Sometimes it's we have cases where it's true. We have cases where it's not true. So what we're doing is looking for conditions where this equivariant generalization of Fried's conjecture is true. And that's ongoing work with my PhD student Chris Pyre. So I think I'll uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Are there any questions? You don't want to continue? So, uh, time is up, right? No, oh, yes, you're right. Oh, oh I, <laughs> you're right. Time is up. You're right. Okay, so let's thank our speaker. <laughs> okay, questions, please. Tomek, any more? Maybe not a question, it's my loud thinking. Uh, so if you if you are counting uh, the algebraic number of fixed points, you can use this Lefschetz number. Mm -hmm. If this cohomology vanishes and there are no fixed points, you can count these uh, periodic orbits mm -hmm. of the flow, for instance. Uh, so I wonder. Uh, could be this uh, uh, this number regarded you are defining uh, could be this number uh, or, or this invariant regarded as some some secondary Lefschetz number. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question um, because the Lefschetz number satisfies a lot of nice properties, yes. some multiplicativity and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in there's a special case of a special type of flow called um, the suspension flow of diffeomorphism. Uh, in that special case, already in the compact setting, um, the Fried conjecture turns out to really boil down to um, the left shift fixed point theorem of uh, of Atiyah and Bot. So, and in that case, the proof of that equality, you really see that this number is uh, is a left shift number of something. So. You are right that in a sense this is a generalization of Lefschetz number in some sense. So for the yeah, for if you have a map from a manifold to itself, a diffeomorphism, from that you can construct a flow on the manifold times the real numbers. And the Rosita function for that flow gives you back the Lefschetz number. So in that sense, your comment is uh, is is, uh, is right that, that this is some kind of version of the Lefschetz number. Mm -hmm. So which of the many properties of Lefkoe's numbers are preserved in this generalization? For instance, if you have a Lefkoe's number, you can construct a data function. Uh -huh. Here you have also data function. So, okay. so there is some parallel, parallel philosophy behind, behind them, okay. at least. OK. Yeah. I have a se second question, if I could. Uh, second question is about the use of the word equivariant. Mm -hmm. In the context of cohomology, uh, usually, by equivalent in topology, people understand um, cohomology of something which is called the Borel construction. Or the Carton construction. And on the level of the, the RAM uh, cohomology, for instance, uh, you have some algebraic models of, of, of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, equivariance means uh, invariance with respect to, to some action of some group. That's some right. Proper action of some group, okay? So I wonder if if these results could be somehow extended to uh, to uh, equivariant setting in the sense of algebraic topology. So a good question. So uh, equivariant cohomology in the sense that you are mentioning is yeah. that the model of some Laplacian? Maybe uh, there there is this what is it the Cartan model, right? Uh, wait, which is could you repeat? Sorry, I lost this word. If you look at the, the, I think it's called the Cartan model of equivariant yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A boundary map. Uh, does that satisfy some kind of uh, Hodge theorem? Like, the, can you form a Laplacian so that the kernel of that Laplacian is equivariant cohomology? And maybe in cases where this vanishes, can you form analytic torsion in that equivariant cohomology inspired sense? And the answer is I don't know, but it's, it sounds like it sounds like an interesting problem. Mm -hmm. So I could explain why I'm asking this question, because uh, if you have this equivariant setting, then you have very powerful theorems, uh, which are called localization theorems, 
to something concentrated uh, at, uh, for instance, the, the normal bundle of, of, of fixed points. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how these localization theorems here correspond to, uh, to counting of this periodic, uh, periodic, uh, if, if I'm, if I can be a little bit philosophical, I think this is there is also already some kind of localization happening at localization at periodic orbits or something because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It sees the whole manifold. Yes. Look, I mean, uh, the left shift fixed point theorem of Atia Bot, for example, is a localization theorem, right? Because you get uh, expressions. Yes. Precisely. In the case of the suspension flow I just mentioned, it's literally well, not literally, but almost it's based on that on that theorem. And yeah. I, the way I see it. Is that I'm, I'm okay? I'm going to uh, show you the last slide. But well, you're probably happy that I didn't talk to, or didn't uh, tell you all of this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this expression for the Rosita function in terms of this flat phrase looks a bit like this in brackets because there's some regularization going on. Analytic torsion looks similar. Where here there's a heat kernel, and here there is the map of pulling of the, the flow map lifted to to p forms. And this to me is something local. Just you're 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 moving. It's a different morphism. Yes. It's something non-local. So that if these two are equal, I it's I see it as some kind of localization process. That's, Precisely. That's right. Yes, it's a localization. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's a localization, a usual localization. Uh, if you ex extend this theory to, to some equivariant. Yes, and I think it's very interesting. Um, I, I don't think it's been looked at in that context. Um, yeah, so make a look at the spectrum of some Laplacian that defines the covariant cohomology. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe. All right. Anybody else? else? No. Mm -hmm. No. Can you say uh, something about the Fried conjecture? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Emma. <clears throat> Sorry. Peter, can you say something about the Fried conjecture? Yes, uh, I can. I can. As I mentioned, there are cases where it's true and cases where it's not true, and there's a very important case where it's not true. So we have to be realistic about this. Um, okay, in the case where you take uh, a flow on a compact manifold and you lift to the universal cover, then you can talk about a covariant torsion and a covariant Fried conjecture. Um, in that case. Generally, our equivariant version doesn't hold. For example, in the case proved by Fried for hyperbolic manifolds, um, if you if you take mm. the least flow and lift to universal cover, it has no periodic curves on that peri on that universal cover. If you take the Ruvel zeta function for the identity element, it's it's made up out of really periodic curves, and in this case there are, there are none, so you get one, you get trivial. In that case, the corresponding number for the um, analytic torsion is L2 analytic torsion, which can be different from one. And th they are not equal. But Fried showed that the, if you take the product of all conjugacy classes of those numbers in suitably interpreted, then they are equal. So the individual factors are not equal, only the product is equal, and at least one factor is not equal, so maybe some other factors are equal. So that's a case where you can't expect it to hold in general. But we did computations uh, you know, for the circle or for the line, it's all fine. So then it's all true. So, <clears throat> um, and also for the, uh, let's see, this is probably the most non-trivial example. Yeah, for the, the um, this is also a flat case, the unit sphere bundle of the of Rn, uh, acted on by some, we had to take some discrete subgroup of the Euclidean motion group and then take our group elements in the right way. There we also got the equality. So there are some examples that's been computed where, 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 where the equality comes out. And we're just at a starting point. So we're just thinking, okay, is there any way you can formulate conditions where it's true or is any class where, it, where, where, it, where it's true? So we're kind of exploring that in that sense. I have a question about this G, little g. Is this some special G or, or is it a gen generic G? Um, you mean on this slide or in general? Did, did this G making this uh, last equality? Yeah. 
Yeah, this uh, this um, here we, we took uh, the right kind of G where we can could compute both sides. So the, the proof in this example, which is by by computation, uh -huh. uh, and so we could do the computation for for G of a certain form and groups of a certain form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, there is any relation of this uh, invariance with, in terms of uh, groupoids, direct level of the groupoid? Yeah, so, so to do this for uh, for groupoid actions or something? Yeah, no, in this case, you have group action on many, so you can interpret directly this in terms of groupoid. So what would you could... I mean, action groupoid, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that you can generalize all this construction. Mm -hmm. So maybe in terms of differential operator on yep. manifold and group points in this case. This this hasn't been done as far as I know, but uh, but who knows? Maybe it's um, if you can reformulate this entirely in terms of the action group point, um, maybe it's possible. Or in the case of the um, of a proper free action like like the the the, the, um, the fu um, fundamental group acting universal cover. You can look at the gauge group point. Uh, and I, in a different context, I've been looking at other constructions on group points where it turns out that this G trace I noticed has a very natural form on the gauge group point. Um, maybe that context can, yeah, uh, it hasn't been looked at, but it's certainly an interesting suggestion. Thank you. I think that uh, maybe it's not about the uh, group points because because uh, there's a notion of a flat connection but the notion of a flat connection makes sense for the algebraids mm. so the action of of the group g's is a in a sense it's a one side of the story mm. but but this uh, the ram complex these twisted forms can be forms longitudinal forms uh, Twisted by some representation of leaves of of a foliation, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this you mean that you have a representation that the algebra is associated with the foliation in terms yeah. of this connection or yeah. the flat connection. So, so this makes sense, but but considering this problem for um, arbitrary arbitrary, arbitrary group O is extending the action of the group G would be very difficult. Yeah. And maybe with the addition you know, of other ingredients, maybe it's okay. Maybe, yes, maybe. You need some conditions. I mean, um, yeah, it could be. Could be even you have condition. always a natural action of the group point in itself. So there, that could be something like this. There is always an equivalence in, for the group point. Yeah. Listen, for example, is there some notion of analytic for foliations? Oh, I may have read about it somewhere. Yeah. If you have a foliated manifold, that you can also do some version of analytic torsion. And I don't know if that involves a group or it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very uh, interesting. Hey, anybody else? Richard? Yeah, I'm muted. Yes. <laughs> I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay. Actually, yes, there is a notion of uh, uh, these Vardos constructions for foliations. And I, I guess you can uh, translate them into groupoids. Mm -hmm. So, okay. But it's not done, as far as I know. Okay. Is that a connection to modular theory? I think there could be some connection with this uh, invariance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anybody else who would like to ask a question? Either Adam? No, no. Thank you for the talk. I don't have any questions. Okay, so I guess in this case, we should thank our speaker again. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let me stop the recording first.